Charles Sagan once said, if you're going to make an apple pie from scratch, first you have to invent the universe. And when we invented the universe that we call popular music, there was a big bang. And after that, it all just seemed to make sense. This is The Righteous Bojambo, and it's time to talk about chaos, cosmos, and Mamie Smith. Everything has to begin some way, with something. August 2020 saw the 100th anniversary of one certain something, the coming together of streams musical, commercial and cultural in an event which signaled the start of mass popular music. And it happened on August the 10th, 1920, on West 45th Street in New York City. And the event that occasioned the moment was Marnie Smith recording a song called Crazy Blues, which was no less than the first record ever made by an African-American singer, written by an African-American composer in the African-American musical idiom, performed by African-American musicians with the intention of being marketed towards primarily urban African-American audiences and 1920-style white hipsters, of course. What it did was not only introduce the rich tradition of black music to a larger audience, but also opened the door to its becoming the dominant influence on popular music over the next hundred years and for the foreseeable future. So that's Carl Sagan's apple pie. But first we have to create the universe. So let's go back before then outside of the classic canon and have a look at the development of the record industry. After a long period of development, the first working phonograph arrived in 1877, Edison's famous Mary Had a Little Lamb demonstrator. Of course, sound quality was terrible, and after a fitful attempt to fix the issues, Edison gave up and went off to invent the light bulb instead. After a long period of refinement, much of it done by an offshoot of Bell, some of the issues had been resolved, including the use of a hardened wax cylinder and grooves that ran side to side, not up and down, as Edison had done. Originally, they were envisaged as dictation machines or talking letters. By 1885, phono lounges had popped up at tourist resorts and fun fairs where listeners could pay per selection for current pop song or comedy routines performed largely by whatever talent could be sourced to make the recordings. The first hit records, such as that people would seek them out after listening to them to purchase, were pretty much what you'd expect for the early 1890s, Sweet Adeline or Hello My Baby. By 1900, the first artist to have regular hit records under his own name was the band leader John Philip Souser, he of the Monty Python theme fame, who, despite despising recorded music and saying so at every opportunity, and very rarely actually conducting the orchestra that bore his name at recording sessions, sold substantial enough numbers of these records for them to still be quite easily located a hundred years later in second-hand stores. The most remarkable thing about these records is their volume and clarity, even when played on contemporary machines. Wax cylinders, which originally wore out after about 20 plays, competed with shellac discs up until World War I, surprisingly lingering on until 1929 when Edison went broke, before the RIAA finally killed them off in the early 1940s. The first and fatal nail in their coffin, however, was a recording from 1895 from a chap called George Washington Johnson called The Laughing Song, which became a runaway hit. Back then, every wax cylinder was a master recording. So given that this record eventually sold 50,000 copies, Johnson would have to sit in front of seven acoustic horns and sing the song over and over again, each take producing three or four usable cylinders, just to keep up demand. As Johnson was a pretty well-known star of African-American theatre, it wasn't as if the Edison company could hire a ringer to sit in for him and sing the song. 
So he had to sing it over 10,000 times, which was good for him because the one-off payments he got from making the record supplemented his income nicely, despite his standing as the first real superstar of African-American music. Johnson died in obscurity in 1914, but was by accounts a quite unpleasant character who was implicated in the death of two of his wives and tried for one but found not guilty. So, given the potential of a cylinder to sell this many copies, even allowing for rebuying ones that wore out, the concept of mastering had to be addressed. This in turn drove the development of hard shellac discs. Edison stuck doggedly to making cylinders, not relenting until 1913. The Victor Company only made flat discs, and Columbia, the third of the big three major labels at the time, made both formats. All three companies made their own players and the formats were not interchangeable. After 1901, when flat discs started to become widely available, record player sales took off. Before World War I, they became available for less than $40, which was seen as a crucial price point. Record sales went from about $4 million a year in 1900 to $30 million a year by 1910 and stayed high during World War I. In 1902, Enrico Caruso's recording of Vescula Juba from Pagliacci started its journey to becoming the first million seller, even if it did take seven years and two re-recordings to do so. Despite this boon, records were barely 10% of the total music market, which was still dominated at the time by sheet music. Recordings of popular songs usually weren't made until after sheet music sales had tailed off. But by the early 20s, musicians were relearning to play songs by listening to records rather than reading sheet music, so sheet music sales started their slow decline to irrelevance by 1960. Another boost to record sales came in 1910, when after years as being seen merely as promotional souvenir products for stage shows, a record called Has Anyone Here Seen Kelly by Broadway singer Nora Bays made a big hit despite the show it was supposed to promote being a complete failure. Records were now an outlet for popular songs outside of stage shows, which gave birth to the idea of the independent songwriter. Finally, the most compelling argument to drive forward the record industry came when entrepreneurial types saw the recent developments in technology, making startup in the industry easier and the phenomenal profits there were to be made. It cost roughly 20 cents to make a record. That included a one-off payment to the artist, licensing the music, and retailers got about 15% of the take. That is, if you used an independent retailer. A lot of the indie labels at the time were owned by furniture or musical instrument chains that sold record players, so there was no retail overhead. Distribution costs were negligible and you just made your records to suit the format of the player you sold. A record cost between 85 cents and $1.25, so at the very worst you got about 56 cents a record. If you sold 5,000 copies, that would mean about $40,000 in profit in today's money. If you had a serious hit, you were earning some serious money. So America got to doing what it does best, business. Once Zenit Records won its lawsuit against Victor to be able to manufacture discs which could be played on Victrola record players, there was a proliferation of independent labels, as we saw in TRB 06. What drove these independent labels was jazz. By the time World War I came around, Yass, as it was known then, began its journey out of the Fourth Ward in New Orleans and up the Mississippi to Memphis, St. Louis, and ultimately Davenport, before going where the money was, Chicago first, and that was the hotbed of jazz at the start of the Jazz Age, then very much later New York. Joe Oliver had visited New York with a vaudeville troupe, both in 1915 and 1917, but his music was seen as mere novelty music. Freddie Capard, Buddy Bolden's successor and Joe Oliver's predecessor as King of New Orleans Trumpet, was courted by Victor but dropped when he wanted whatever Caruso got. A group of white musicians, however, billing itself as the original Dixieland Jazz Band, came in 1917 to record for Victor and were tossed out of the studio for being too loud. Four days later they were invited back and in recording Tiger Rag and Livery Stable Blues, made the first jazz records. But after the ODJB had soon left New York for Europe, 
The town was a fallow field for jazz for many years until the Harlem Renaissance and Mayor Jimmy Walker's famous blind eye to speakeasies finally gave New York at first parody and then, by 1930, supremacy over Chicago. But thankfully, amidst this fallow field, there was an outlier. OK Records, founded in 1918 in the great boom for indies, had its A&R division headed by one of the greatest talent scouts and producers in history, a man called Ralph Peer. Critical in the development of blues, jazz and country music, it was he, working with a songwriter and arranger called Perry Bradford, who decided to test the market amongst the urban African-American population in New York for African-American artists. After much negotiation, Peer convinced label head Harry Hager to agree to take a shot. Hager, defying warnings from several white observers, arranged the sessions for February 1920 to produce two sides for Mamie Smith, a 25-year veteran of vaudeville who was widely popular with both black and white audiences. But there was a caveat. Smith had to record two pop songs to test the marketplace. The record, That Thing Called Love, backed with You Can't Keep a Good Man Down, did well, and Hager agreed to recording a blues song at an August session to be supervised by Pia. Bradford engaged an all-black band to back Smith and sorted the arrangements, and history was made. But why Mamie Smith? Why her above all of the other more famous and celebrated female blues singers such as Ida Cox or Ma Rainey or Bessie Smith? In deciding for Marnie Smith, three factors would have come into play. One was simply that Marnie Smith was a lot better known name in New York with her long experience on the Waterville stage. Two was that Smith's diction was far superior to Bessie Smith or Ma Rainey or any of the other female blues singers at the time. And three was because Marnie Smith was a Northern African-American, so she wasn't possessed of the strong Dixieland Southern accent that the other singers had, which may have alienated Northern audiences. Crazy Blues is often thought to be the first blues record, but it isn't really. As Bradford had written it as a stage piece, it mixes 12 bar blues verses with 16 bar pop verses. It opens with a pop verse, then a blues, then a pop, then two blues, and then a pop verse to close. The tempo is stately, but Smith, especially on the blues verses, which feature what are known as floating lyrics, manages to wring genuine pathos from the song. She is clearly a skillful singer who brings all of her experience on stage to the song. Clearly within three years, Bessie Smith has made her style seem old fashioned, but she should be well remembered, not for just being an innovator, but for being a genuine talent in her own right. So unbeknownst to them, history had been made. Like most early songs, an accurate record of sales is impossible beyond the initial catalogue run of a record, as hit records sold over many, many years. It's known that Crazy Blues sold 75,000 copies in its first two months, which was a huge hit by the standards of the day, and about 150,000 in six months, and by 1929, when it dropped out of the OK catalogue, possibly due to the master physically wearing out, it's estimated that a million copies had been sold. But as a landmark, it's priceless. The blues and all that was to spring from it ended the classic canon. And in proving that regional music styles could sell, it sparked a mania for getting scouts out into rural and regional America, where they discovered more blues singers by 1922. The musicians who sowed the seed for folk music by 1924, the Piedmont Blues by 1925. And thanks to Pierre's position as the greatest talent scout in the history of the canon, country music at its epic Bristol sessions in 1927 that gave us the Carter family and the great Jimmy Rogers were brought into the fold. Mamie Smith had another 10 years in theatre, radio and films, giving a young Coleman Hawkins his first gig, but still died too young and penurious in 1946. Perry Bradford actually came out of the whole thing very much the worse, as he had cobbled together a couple of his old songs to make Crazy Blues. The owner of the copyright on those songs sued him, and he lost all of the money that he made on the record. The Great Depression wiped out whatever stocks he had remaining, and he had to keep scuffling for the rest of his life. Best remembered by rock and roll fans, though, for writing Keep a Knockin' for Little Richard. 
There was interest in popular music before the classic canon, no doubt, but to my mind, the democratization and dominance of popular music with that perfect confluence of the artists, the socioeconomic circumstances, and an increasingly affluent society and good old fashioned entrepreneurial capitalism that built the classic canon all began on that August day in Hell's Kitchen in 1920.